Hey everybody, Dr. Phil here. So this is a bit video on flexible budgeting. Um, so in this video, we're gonna talk about things like fixed budgets, static budgets, um, and flexible budgets. Um, a little more about, what, what I'm, one, I'm gonna start by saying an apples to apples versus apples to oranges comparison. So that will make a little more sense um, in a few minutes. So let's start with fixed and flexible budgets. So managers use budgets to control operations and see that planned objectives are met. So a master budget is based on a predicted level of activity for the budget period. So obviously it's done beforehand. Budget reports compare actual results to budgeted results. Obviously that's done during the period. The fixed budget or the static budget, you can really use those terms interchangeably, is based on one predicted amount of sales or other activity measure, basically their best guess of what will happen in the forthcoming period. And the flexible budget or variable budget based on more than one amount of sales or other activity measure. So let's take a look at a fixed budget performance report. So a fixed budget is based on one predicted amount of sales, right? So just one. So the fixed budget here is based on 100 units uh, is sales, right? So if they sell 100 units, then they make 80 grand, variable cost 36, contribution margin 44, fixed cost of 20. So they would presumably generate income of 24,000. Again, remember this is just a guess, this is a budget, right? Now the actual results, they did quite a bit better, right? 140, so obviously their sales uh, dollars were higher because they, they sold more. Uh, we'll talk about these variances in a second. They had higher variable costs. Again, you would expect that because they sold more units. Their contribution margin was higher, again, as it should be. Their fixed costs were a little higher, uh, not much, but an extra 400 and their income was certainly higher. So the fixed budget performance report compares actual results with results expected under a fixed budget. Now, as you can see, the fixed budget, as we just said, is based on 100 units, but 140 actual units were sold, resulting in the variances that we see here. So whenever you see the F, that stands for favorable. Um, anything that's favorable is gonna increase net income. Anything that's unfavorable is gonna decrease net income. So for example, sales, 25,000 favorable. They, they obviously generated more sales revenues, so that's favorable. Uh, variable costs, they had more, that was unfavorable, but remember, they also sold more, so you, know, you would expect that. Contribution margin was higher, as it should be, 6,400 favorable. Fixed costs were $400 higher, so that's, of course, unfavorable. And overall, their income was 6,000 more based than, you know, than based on their fixed budget. 30,000 versus 24, so that of course is favorable. So the purpose of flexible budgets, um, they're prepared before the period begins and they are based on several levels of activity. So I think like what if type scenarios, right? Um, these are better because they provide an apples to apples comparison, right? They're also typically prepared after the period ends to help evaluate performance, right? And so also helps management focus on any problems. Let me just circle back real quick to this apples to apples comparison. So if you think about, if I go back to the previous slide, you think about it, this is not really an apples to apples comparison, right? Because we're comparing what we thought we would sell, 100 units, with what we actually sold of 140. So of course, these numbers are gonna be different, right? You're gonna have different sales amounts and revenues, you're gonna have different variable costs. Apparently even your fixed costs change slightly. So trying to compare these two, like the 100 fixed budget, so the actual results of 140 is, it isn't really an apples to apples comparison, right? That's where the apples to oranges comparison comes in. So preparation of flexible budgets. So we can see here a flexible budget for this, this particular company. We can see their sales, right? The variable amount per unit is 10. So if they sell, you know, 10,000 units, then 10 per unit times 10,000 is your 100. 10 per unit times, 100, times 12, excuse me, is your 120 and then 10 times 14 is your 140. So this is like saying, these are three scenarios, right? Like what if we sell 10,000 units? What if we sell 12,000 units? What if we sell 14,000 units? And then we have our various costs here. So all we're doing is we're taking our per unit costs, like for materials, a dollar, right? $1 times 10,000 is your 10. $1 times 12,000 is your 12. A dollar times 14 is your 14. And you can do the same with all of these, right? Labor, indirect materials, sales commissions, if we add up all um, of our variable cost, the dollar plus the dollar fifty, plus the twenty cents plus the two ten, it's going to give us this four eighty. Um, and then we're basically saying ten dollars per unit in sales, 
minus 480 in variable costs is going to yield will give us this 520 of contribution margin and again you can do the same thing like you know uh, 480 times 10,000 48 right 480 times 12,000 uh, 57.6 480 times 14,000 67.2 then we get to our fixed costs so as you can see uh, as we work our way across uh, 28 28 28 11 11 11 and 1 1 and 1 as as it should be right because within the relevant range these fixed costs should not change so just because we go from you know 10,000 units sales to 12,000 or to 14 these should um, they should stay the same and we can see here that they they plan that they will stay the same so then we just all we have to do then is we have to add up our fixed costs so like 28 plus the 11 plus the 1 40,000 in all three cases so we have income of 12,000 so the 12,000 um, and you can do the same for these these other two as well based on 10,000 unit sales we have 100,000 sales minus 48,000 variable costs is your 52 contribution margin minus your 40 is your 12,000 and like I say you can do the same thing for these two sales unit levels too all right so a flexible budget performance report compares the actual performance and budgeted performance based on the actual level so this is more of the kind of like apples to apples type comparison if you will so favorable sales variance was because the average selling price was greater than 10 10 dollars per unit the unfavorable total direct materials and direct labor variances because actual costs are greater than expected and favorable sales commissions variance because actual sales commissions are less than expected. So, you know, again, we're looking at, um, now this is the apples to apples comparison, right? The flexible budget based on 12,000 units. If we go back, that's the middle one here, right? And then we're saying, well, we actually did sell 12,000 units. So this is now a good comparison. So what we've basically done is we've basically taken, we've accounted for, if you will, the volume variance, right? We don't have different volumes of, you know, the amount we thought we'd sell and then the amount we did sell, right? 12,000 planned, 12,000 actual. So we've taken care of the volume difference. So based on that, we should sell, um, we should have made 120 grand, right? We made 125, so it's a little higher, so that's good, right? And then we can do the same. I won't go through every single one of these, but we can kind of do the same thing, right? Materials, based on selling 12,000 units, we should have spent 12 grand. Oh wait, we spent 13, so it's unfavorable. Um, direct labor should have spent 18 grand we spent 20 also unfavorable and that's basically all we're doing all the way down right now if we get down to our fixed costs we know that for depreciation and supervisor salaries they're both good for insurance it was a little higher it was 200 bucks higher so maybe the insurance renewed the rate went up for example that could that could be one explanation for that 200 dollars unfavorable variance and then we get down to income so based on everything you see here sales variable costs contribution margin and fixed costs we should have made 22.4 we actually ended up making 25.4 so we made 3,000 more than planned right so remember like I said before favorable makes net income go up unfavorable makes net income go down all right so let's talk a little bit now about standard costing so standard costs can be used in a flexible budgeting system to enable management to better understand the reasons for variances okay so standard costs are Preset costs for delivering a product or service under normal conditions. So they're basically their costs that they figured out ahead of time. Like this unit should cost us this much. It, sh it should take this long to build this unit, so on and so forth. Standard costs are also the expected level of performance. And manufacturers use standard costing for direct materials, direct labor, and overhead costs. So setting standard costs. So for direct materials, uh, we, the cost we have to think about the quantity, how much do we need? Because maybe we can get things like bulk discounts. Also think about like the grade of material, basically like what kind of quality is it? Obviously the higher the quality, the more you're gonna pay for it. And then for direct labor, we could look at things like motion and time studies to determine how long it should you know, feasibly, reasonably take to do something. And then for variable overhead, we'll look at the resource consumption for uh, variable overhead in currents. So let's take a look at an example of standard costs. So the standard cost of direct materials, direct labor and overhead <clears throat> for one bat manufactured by ProBat are shown below. So this is called a standard cost card. So you notice on this standard cost card, we have our materials, labor and overhead. Um, if we look at materials first, if you want to build one bat, you're going to need 2.2 pounds at a cost of $10 per pound. 
So your standard cost for materials is 22, for, again, for one bat. For labor, $2, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, two direct labor hours at a cost of $15 per direct labor hour, so two times the 15. To, again, to build one bat, it's gonna cost you $30 in direct labor. And then for overhead, we have two direct labor hours, um, which of course is mirroring the direct labor hours above it, because apparently here, direct labor hours are driving the overhead. That's the allocation base. And the rate is $5 per direct labor hour for the overhead. So two times the five is your 10. So your, sta your total standard cost for materials, labor, and overhead is 62. Of course, that's not what they're charging for it. They'd be charging more. And these standard cost amounts are then used to prepare manufacturing budgets for a certain budgeted level of production. All right, so now let's talk about cost variances. So think about, we all know what the word variance or vary means, like vary means it isn't where you thought it would be. It's kind of moved a little bit perhaps. Cost variance is the difference between actual and standard cost. If actual cost is less than standard cost, then the variance is favorable. If the actual cost is more than the standard cost, then the variance is unfavorable, okay? So cost variance analysis. So here's kind of what we would do to um, analyze our cost variances. The first thing we would do is we would prepare a standard cost performance report, and then we would compute and analyze the variances, what's, you know, what's favorable, what's unfavorable. Don't, don't assume that just because it's favorable, it wouldn't be investigated. A lot of times favorable variances are, are investigated as well. Number three, identifying questions and their answers. Basically, like, well, you know, what caused the variance and what can we do about it? And then number four, obviously taking corrective and strategic actions to try to close those variance gaps. So cost variance computation. So management needs information about the factors causing a cost variance, but first it must properly compute the variance. In its most simple form, a cost variance or CV is computed as, and this, these are the formulas that we use. Right, so this is pretty much for any materials or labor or even variable overhead variances. We have the actual quantity times the actual price on the left. That's the actual cost. And then we have the standard quantity times the standard price on the right. That's gonna help, that's gonna help us determine our cost variance. So the actual quantity, AQ, it's often abbreviated AQ, is the actual amount of direct material or direct labor used to manufacture the actual quantity of output. The standard quantity, SQ, is the standard amount of input for the actual quantity of output. The actual price, AP, is the actual amount paid to acquire the actual direct material or the direct labor used during the period. And the standard price, SP, is just that, the standard price. So direct materials and direct labor variances. So there's two main factors that cause materials and labor variances. And those two main factors are what you see here, right? Price variance and quantity variance. So what we basically do is we use these formulas, we just plug in our numbers like actual quantity times actual price, right? Minus actual quantity times standard price. You can see here, what are, what are they really varying? Well, let's start with what they're not varying. They're not varying the quantity, right? That's being held constant, AQ on both sides, but they are varying the price. So that's gonna give us the price difference. If you look over to the right of the quantity variance, think about what they're not now, um, what they're not now, um, Varying, if you will, they're not varying price, right? Standard price in both cases, but now they're varying actual quantity and standard quantity. And then if we do that, we kind of net these against each other to get a uh, total cost variance. So let's look at an example. So this is direct, we'll start with direct materials variances. So GMAX produced and sold 3,500 units. They used 1,800 pounds of direct materials at $21 per pound. The standard is 1,750 pounds. Uh, a 0.5 pounds, so half pound per unit at $20 per pound. So you can see below where I just plugged in the numbers, right? Actual quantity and price, 1,800 pounds. It says used 1,800 pounds times 21 per pound. It says at DM at 21 per pound is gonna give you your 37.8. The standard quantity and price, uh, the standard was 1750 and the standard price was 20, so 35,000. So we can see here that the direct materials variance is 2800 unfavorable, right? The actual quantity and price was 37.8. The standard was 35. So basically what we're saying is it cost us 2800 more than we expected. And then you can see below where we, again, just kind of plugged in the numbers, right? 1800 times 21, 37.8. 1800 times 20, 36. 1750 times 20 is your 35. And then we have a, a, a price variance here of 1800 unfavorable. 
and we have a quantity variance of 1,000 unfavorable. And of course, if you net those two together, 1,800 unfavorable plus 1,000 unfavorable, that's giving us the 2,800 unfavorable you see here in the red. And then if you come down to the bottom, 2,800 unfavorable, there it is again. So direct materials variance, 2,800 unfavorable, 1,800 unfavorable plus the 1,000 unfavorable. All right, so what about evaluating direct materials variances? So who is responsible for direct material cost variances? So typically the direct material cost variances, um, would the person responsible for that would typically be the purchasing manager, not so much the production manager, because the purchasing manager is the one that actually purchases the stuff. The production manager is just the person who sort of issues it into production, if you will. Now notice a couple of the scenarios here, right? I am not responsible for this unfavorable material quantity variance because you purchased cheap material, so my people had to use more of it. Makes sense, right? And then the other person is saying, you use too much material because of poorly trained workers and poorly maintained equipment. So one thing I've always said um, sort of over the years is that you know, variances help us generate questions, right? We go, why is this unfavorable? Why is this favorable? You know, and where's, where is it coming from? Who is responsible for it? So how do we get it fixed? All right, let's look at direct labor variances. So GMAX produced and sold 3,500 units. They used 1,700 hours of direct labor at $33 an hour. Again, the standard was 1,750 pounds, um, 0.5 hours per unit at $32 per hour. So again, I just plugged in my numbers, right? Actual quantity and rate, 1,700 hours times 33. Um, that's all up here uh, to get 56,100. And then standard quantity and rate, 1,750 hours, which of course is here, times the $32 per hour. So we have a direct labor variance of $100 unfavorable. So that's not, that's not terrible. That probably isn't something that they would really worry about investigating too much because it's just not that big of a variance. And then just like before, you can see where we plugged in the numbers at the bottom, right? Actual, actual cost, right? So 1,700 hours times 33 versus 1,700 hours times 32 versus 1750 hours times 32. So we have our 1700 unfavorable rate variance. We have our 1600 favorable efficiency variance and they're basically netting these against each other, which gives us a $100 unfavorable direct labor variance. So evaluating the direct labor variances. So one possible explanation of GMAX's labor rate and efficiency variances is the use of workers with different skill levels. So using highly paid um, skilled workers to perform unskilled tasks results in an unfavorable rate variance. However, fewer labor hours might be required for the work resulting in a favorable efficiency variance. So what they're really saying here is if you use more like highly trained, highly skilled people, they cost you more, but maybe they save you time. So here we see the flexible overhead budget, right? So kind of like, kind of like what we looked at before, right? We've got the production, uh, we've got the production in units, so the variable amount per unit based on one unit. We've got all our amounts here, so like labor, 80 cents per unit, indirect materials, 60 cents per unit, power and lights, 40 cents per unit, maintenance, 20 cents per unit, for a total variable overhead cost of $2 per unit. And we'll get to the fix down here in a second, but let's just look at some of these. So again, it would be like, okay, well, 70% of capacity level, so 3,500 production in units, so, and then 0.8, 2,800, right? 80% of the 40,000, 32, so on and so forth. And then for, if we look at the fixed cost, we can see all the way across, right? 2,000 all the way across for building rent, 4,000 all the way across for machinery, 6,000 all the way across for salaries. And then we just add all up all our total fixed costs. Then we have our total overhead, um, which would just be the sum. The 19,000, for example, here is based on the sum of the variable cost of seven plus the total fixed overhead of 12 to give us a total of 19. And then you can sub 10 the same logic for the 80, 90, and 100% levels as well. So the standard overhead rate. So how do we determine that? So the first thing we do is we determine an allocation base. The allocation base is basically like, what if you had to pick one thing that most drives the overhead, what would that be? Step two is predict an activity level. So sort of how much of that activity do you think is gonna happen? Step three is compute the standard overhead rate. So the standard overhead rate is just simply the budgeted overhead at the predicted activity level divided by the standard allocation base at that predicted activity level. 
So by way of an example, because you'll see like most things in accounting, once you see the numbers, it's a lot easier than just, you know, looking at this is a lot easier than just looking at that. So they said, okay, well, we have 20,000 um, budgeted overhead, and then the, the allocation base in this case is DLH, which is direct labor as. So we have $10 per direct labor as. So what they're really saying there in kind of like plain English is, for every one direct labor hour that you work on a, on a project, on a unit, for every one direct labor hour, you should apply $10 to cover the overhead. So for example, if you worked five direct labor hours, it would be $10 times five. And then we can see down here, the actual total overhead given was 18,150. The standard overhead applied was 17,500. So the overhead variance is 650 unfavorable. Right, so they actually, they, should, they thought they would spend 17,500. That's kind of what they applied over the period. They ended up spending 18,150. So 650 more than they planned. So let's look at the volume variance. So the volume variance is computed as the budgeted overhead minus the standard overhead applied. So we know that we have a 650 unfavorable variance. We just saw that on the last slide. And then here, we're just kind of, again, just kind of plugging in our numbers, right? So the actual total overhead, 18,150 that was given. The flexible overhead was 19. If we go back just real quick, that was here. Total overhead, 19. Uh, and then the standard overhead applied from up here was 17,500. So we have a volume variance. Let's start with the volume variance first. We have a volume variance of 1,500 unfavorable. So we basically corrected. We've, we're taking care of the apples to apples comparison, if you will. And then we have a controllable variance of 850 favorable. So what we're really saying with the 1500 unfavorable volume variance is that, okay, that wasn't really anybody's fault because we, you know, the, the amount that we produced, um, the actual amount was more than or less than budgeted. Once we've taken care of that, this is the controllable variance, 850 favorable. Okay, so as you can see, um, everything you see here is, um, is the same. We're just basically, you know, reinforcing the point that the controllable variance is, I mean, yeah, you certainly pay attention to the volume variance, but you would be, you're more concerned with the controllable variance because again, the volume variance, that 1500 and favorable, that's just like saying, okay, well, we produced more, the actual production was more or less than what we planned. That's not really anybody's fault. Um, I mean, if it's more, it's typically a good thing, right? Because we've made more in sales, but we do want to pay attention to this, um, the controllable variance. And here we just have an overhead variance report where we just basically just put it all together, right? You can see that their expected was 80% of capacity. Their actual was only 70%, right? So this is where we're using that flexible budget, comparing it to the actual, and we're looking at our total overhead costs. And what we're really looking for, if we go back, you can see here the 850 favorable, the controllable variance. So that's basically, you know, distilled down to all these, right? So the 850 is a culmination of you know, a 425 favorable indirect labor variance, a 175 favorable uh, indirect materials variance, so on and so forth. All right, uh, last thing we'll do is look at sales variances, just to give you a little bit of, of exposure to this. So a similar analysis can be applied to sales variances. So we'll use two additional GMAX products, Excel golf balls and Big Bird drivers to illustrate. So sales of the Excel golf balls and units was 1,000 units, but they sold, their budget was 1,000, they sold 1,100, that's good. The sales price was gonna be 10, but it ended up being 1050. The sales of the Big Bird drivers was 150, but they only sold 140, so 10 less units. And the sales price per Big Bird driver was supposed to be 200, or budgeted at 200, it ended up being 190. So again, all we're gonna do here is we're just, just, just like before, we're just gonna plug in all our numbers. So we note that the sales price variance minus the actual sales price minus the budgeted. And then for sales volume variance, actual sales minus budgeted. So really it's just a question of plugging in all your numbers. Everything you need for, to plug in here is given to you right here. There's not really any calculation, it's just plugging them in. So like 1100, right, times 1050 versus 1100 times 10 versus 1,000 times 10. And then for the Big Burt drivers, right, 140, that was the number of units they sold, times 190, compared to 140 times 200. And then we can compare that to 150 budgeted times the 200. So we get a 850 unfavorable sales price variance, and we get a 1,000 unfavorable 
sales volume variance. Okay, that's it for this video. As always, take care and I will talk to you all soon.